Absolutely. So, Sarah Nichols, thank you so much for uh, for joining us uh, today for today's discussion. I think what we're really interested in in drawing out from you is is your really um, unusual kind of triangle of experiences, I suppose. So, you know, working for a long time with firms at every stage, working with with uh, with corporate growth, helping organisations to accelerate themselves in a range of in a range of tools that will be really interesting to people on, uh, on this webinar. And then secondly, particularly working with startups and trying to help startups that are often going through this difficult process of tr trying to get funding, but then also trying to get funders who don't kill them. You know, uh, you, know, you, you, know you want to have powerful people, but you want to make sure they're not vampires. So, you know, I, I know that you've had so many experiences working with with founders and working with founders who are trying to develop strategies for growth that allow them the opportunity both to gain extra capital or maybe even to release some of their capital but they're not uh, completely lose control or have totally unrealistic uh, goals and then more recently of course i know you've been working uh, deeply with uh, with investors and uh, organizations that play analogous roles to investors uh, incubators people uh, people like this and and of course their needs are going to be rather different you know that you know they're, they're they're not looking for the for the same things so i think this perspective is really um, is really unique now the the, yes. the framework the framework, I should just say, that, that we've got for the for the webinar is is uh, alternating questions. Yeah. So uh, so the idea is that uh, uh, that I'll put a question to you, you'll put a question to me, and then hopefully that will keep it a little bit more uh, more lively. Um, just before I go into that, I just want to say, you know, most of the people who've come into the webinar know me, know CC Group. They, they, they may not you know you so much, or or uh, or, or, or the organisation that, that you're working with, and, and how how you're kind of helping investors to have impact. So I, I wonder, is there something you can say just about how people can get in touch with you, and about the the, the kinds of projects that you're most inspired inspired to be working on in the in the in the short term, in the in the near future? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Duncan. And first of all, I'd just like to say it's great to be uh, doing this webinar with you uh, in particular. You. I know this has been long overdue. We've had a lot of discussions around these topics over over the years, of course. And uh, the the topic in question is, you know, definitely um, one of my passions and, and interests. Um, I think really the main the main way people can get in touch is through Investors with Impact. So, which is my company, so Sarah at investorswithimpact.com, and I'm on LinkedIn, very very active on there. So you can you can find me um, after the after that as well. So um, yeah, I'm just excited to be to be here talking. A lot of my focus has been around um, startups, but I have worked in house at a lot of mature and growth companies as well, um, leading on commercial teams, and also um, in the particular in this instance, the focus today is on on fundraising. Um, but really, to be successful fundraiser, you need to be successful at uh, business overall because mm -hmm. ultimately that's what you're fund that's what you're fundraising for. So, really, um, it's just the tip of the iceberg in a way. Yes, indeed. And and I must say, it must be so interesting uh, to know uh, that that you are visiting in Los Angeles at the moment. You know that that's a city. You know that that uh, that I know I know well. I, I was a student at UCLA. Uh, for a while, and that is just an amazing, uh, an, an amazing environment in, in which to be, uh, to be able to connect with, uh, uh, with organisations. So um, I just want to kind of go into uh, the questions. It's my in in this game of question tennis. It's yes. my uh, yeah. it's my uh, question to uh, to start. I think, and yeah. so so this is my question: What is the opportunity? Uh, for uh, for a tech firm to reach out beyond their initial funders? Yeah, sure. Well, I think this is a classic question that, that really comes up at a point where, um, you know, perhaps fundraising is the, the initial funds are, are running out um, and it's really the company is really at its next stage where, it, where it's at the point where it's looking to in, attract further investment. But I think before the company even gets there, the founder 
there's a few things that um, are really key. And of course, fundraising is probably one of the core activities of any startup founder, because without it, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, develop the product, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, invest in all those sales and marketing strategies that you want to invest in. So really the type of person, first of all, that actually is ideal for a startup, the type of founder is going to be very different to the, the personality and background of, of your growth organization or, or a company more in acceleration, perhaps later on in the fundraising stage, which, which is an obvious point to make, but I think it's an important one. I think as well, other things come up at a, a stage um, where a company is looking for its next round of investment is really, um, and it's true we, even at the beginning, but what we've seen, what we've seen when we're working with startups is the, um, because we do see a lot of the feedback that an investors give, and really, uh, one of the key things that comes out is to make sure that your founding team isn't just reliant on, on one person, so the foundations are right. So not to be that solo founder, um, if you can ensure that right from the beginning, it's gonna help your fundraising process really throughout. Um, I mean, of course, I can. there's all sorts of advice online that you can find about how to create the perfect pitch, and I'm not gonna go into that in massive detail and how to ensure that you're really top of your game on that and top of your game on investment research as well. Um, but but really there's, I mean, I'll point you to, if you go onto any of the websites, you know, Sequoia have a wonderful pitch deck on there, all of that. If you're really top of your game on that, um, then obviously you're gonna be in a much better, better, better space. Reality of course is, is everyone's, everyone's a highly competitive, it's a highly competitive market. Um, and so there's other things we've seen that um, sh show, demonstrate how a CEO can really be creative and entrepreneurial, even in that fundraising process. Um, and to, to think of themselves, to think of themselves, not just as how are they pitching their business, but I think what investors want to see as well is how are they pitching themselves in general? So are there um, a lot of startups for won't won't succeed and investors want to see entrepreneurs who are going to be able to get up and start again whether it's on um, whether it's realigning their business whether it's transforming to really show that resilience as well um, and of course Duncan as you know and both of us cut across working uh, with our experience both in Europe and the US but one thing that excites me about when I think of companies in Europe and how they're having to perhaps compared to US companies do more with less and where there's um, there's obviously still a strong VC uh, environment and background in, in Europe but definitely less so than say US or California which is it's really the heart of, of that way of fundraising but um, to be creative and think about fundraising in a broader perspective so for example how are you how are you actually utilizing your supply chain and creating relationships with them that are going to pre-fund your activities. How are you making them a partner? How are you making your clients a partner? So how are you thinking about, you know, your flagship clients, which I think a lot of startups sometimes don't give enough attention to. And I'm always very biased towards the sales and marketing process because of my background. But if you can really ensure that you've got, um, as well as thinking about your classic either equity or, or debt fundraising, to think about how you're being creative both on the client side and on the supplier side because you can there's a lot of value you can extract there and a lot of uh, deep related relationships you can build early on that will then found your growth some of the most successful consultancies and companies i've seen grow are the ones that had a really really strong client they might have been actually closely aligned or even in, in them they might have been a quasi competitor but somebody who's a company that really from the outset um, you're building that deep relationship with because having that um, having that strong relationship having those strong clients ensures that you're built for the long term and I just think you know focus on clients and and suppliers as much as you can and really ensure that the, those relationships are strong because that's gonna that's gonna build you and that's gonna also tick the boxes that the investors um, are looking for you to, to fulfill as well. Mm -hmm. That absolutely makes sense. So I think now we now we go over to to your first yes. question. Yes. 
I have some a question for you, Duncan, and um, you know, obviously with all the experience, it's just great to to hear your view on this. What would you say? How can startups appear attractive uh, to collaborate with those investors that have the highest potential? I think this is a. I think it really gets to the bottom of of the whole uh, the 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 whole nest of issues that we're that we're discussing on the on the webinar today, which is really about attractiveness, uh, the way that um, the way that vendors look attractive to investors is totally different from the way that investors are seen as being attracted by uh, by uh, by by people who are leading um, uh, businesses startups so this this mismatch i think is 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 something that's really important to explain that the, the different sides are looking for for different things i think a, a key element to understand is risk investors are under uh, are evaluating risk when they're looking at businesses and all the time organizations are, are subject to risk but investors are more familiar with the kinds of risks that startups have you know they've looked dispassionately analytically i think at the at the different stages that a startup uh, goes through and um and investors are cautious yeah nobody wants to put in more money than they think that they will get out so um it means that You've got different sorts of investors who are looking for different kinds of returns. Early stage investors are looking for more aggressive demands. They'll uh, more more aggressive returns. They'll put uh, more aggressive demands on you. Others might be looking at uh, longer term investment. They might have higher expectations of the solidity of your business. They might be looking more carefully at your at your cash flow. Um, but different investors will be looking for different uh, criteria. What they will all care about though is uh, the state of the team that you've got. You know, they'll look at the management team you've got, your ability at attracting uh, talent. They'll look at the other funding you've got and where that other funding has, uh, has come from. And they'll be looking at, at competition, at short-term competition. Uh, and in particular, whether you're differentiated from uh, existing players at the moment, whether it looks as if you're gonna be able to get traction in the market. And also long-term competition, whether you've got a, a, a defensible market, whether you think whether they think you'll be able to create a category where you have some um, some 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 traction. And I also think, alongside that attractiveness of the market and your position in the market, is also the maturity and the flexibility, the coachability that your executives demonstrate to to investors. You can't be defensive in front of your investors, though it's so tempting, really, really so, so tempting uh, to, uh, to do that. So you have to show the ability to deliver and you have to show the flexibility, which means that your investors will um, feel that they will be able to get into reasonable conversations with you when you experience the inevitable need to zigzag, uh, you know, re renegotiate, move forward in, in different ways. It's a really complex challenge, and so many organizations are just uh, focused on uh, on talking about the solution that they've got and why they just need execution. But investors know things don't always work out in such a straightforward way. They need a more coachable uh, management team. What are you, what's you, what are you seeing in terms of analysts, fan teams? Like how and what's the impact? of companies like Gartner Invest and 451 Research is an m and yeah. um, Be good to just hear your insight there, Duncan. Thank you. Well, I think we've seen um, one, one wave of traditional impact and then one wave of, of, uh, of new impact. Firstly, analysts have always been involved in kind of due diligence, uh, in uh, evaluating uh, merger acquisition, investment, even, even at I mean, not exactly small levels, but you know, as, as an analyst at Ovum, I was involved in decisions about like a million pounds, five million pounds, 10 million pounds, I mean, re relatively small investments, I suppose, because even if these investments are small, very often they're being made by organizations that do enough uh, M&A activity, enough investment activity to justify a subscription to an analyst firm. Um, so that, that impact has always been there. And then secondly, what we're seeing are services that are more 
uh, more exactly tailored to the needs of, uh, of investors. So Gartner Invest, for example, is producing research that is really looking at growth opportunities for companies, that is really looking at investment cycles, that is really uh, understanding where, um, where greatest risks and greatest customer demands will be. 451 going e even further in that direction by maintaining a huge database that is tracking privately held technology companies in order to accelerate uh, capital investment and m a inside uh, inside the market and then i would also say thirdly that there's alongside that kind of advisory you know that, that kind of custom consulting work and then and then the, the kind of research services that are coming out oriented at, at, uh, at investors and also thirdly say that kind of off-the-shelf syndicated research has more of an impact on investors than ever before and that's because of the way that um, organizations are developing more services that are tracking early stage technology companies one reflection of that are the awards and designations like Cool Vendor, Hot Vendor, Firestarter, IDC Innovator, um, Gartner Cool Vendor, I suppose is probably the most, uh, the, the most known of those. So these awards accelerate the market. Uh, they validate startups in ways that analyst firms didn't do that uh, before with buyers and, uh, and with investors. And they validate the whole market in which those firms are in. So we've got a customer that's in the kind of financial technology AI space. If when Gartner produces a cool a list of cool vendors that are using AI for financial services, that doesn't only validate the five or six firms that are on that list, it validates the entire, the entire market. If you're a tech fund and you don't really know exactly what is hot, you you you, you don't, you know, maybe you're not completely up to date with trends in the market. Um you can use that information in order to look more credible to potential investors um, to accelerate your time to understanding where there are opportunities for you to gather um, uh, investors who want to sink their money into into a market uh, niche and it doesn't necessarily take the, the the kind of heavy lifting you know the boil the ocean uh, activities that people used to have time for where technologists uh, would would be working with uh, with investors to to understand where the opportunities are for investment and just a just a follow-up question on that i'm always curious how much you think about how much is the research like this actually utilized to really justify decisions that have already been made uh on the micro level versus absolutely actually, actually um you know that pre-evaluation stage and it just yeah absolutely. Your thoughts. yeah you're absolutely right i mean very often analysts use i mean in fact this isn't true of analyst research this is true of facts generally yeah. uh you know people reach their conclusions and then they look for evidence to support their conclusions right. uh you know this happens everywhere in life from i mean absolutely everywhere in life um, and uh, I think it also honestly has to, has to reflect a certain neutrality on what the facts are, which I think we see growing, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's a real thing in civil society. But imagine if you're, um, you know, I'm thinking of our friend who works for a capital fund uh, bouncing around in, uh, in the Nordic region, raising, raising money to be, uh, to be invested. Um, I, I'm sure he's terribly neutral, really, on uh, on on what markets are are growing, on on what investors think about those markets. He, he's using that as as intelligence to motivate the investment. He's completely neutral on, on what it is. Maybe even somewhat disinterested and disengaged on what it is. It's just evidence to stimulate uh, the case for the case for investment. But in other cases, people may know, well, I, I, you know, people keep on telling me about AI, I want to invest in AI. Uh, so, you know, they, they just take a list on AI. They, they, they use that to support the decision. So I think it's not necessarily um, changing people's minds, but it's accelerating the path to the decision. Yeah. And structuring the options very powerfully. 
No, and just leading on from that, how would you say, let's talk a bit about the investors. How can they appear, you know, as attractive as possible when they're actually thinking about collaborating with startups with the highest potential? Because obviously we focus so much on what the startup has to do. What is the, what's the role of the investor uh, in beyond obviously providing um, financing? Mm, mm. Well, I think the key thing here is that they have to present themselves not just as a source of uh, finance, but as a, as a catalyst that can transform the ability of the, of the startup to, to become a reality in its market. Um, yeah. when, when I think of angel investors, I mean, okay, most of the firms that we're speaking with will either never go to angel investors or will give up on angel investors as soon as they're out of working from their, from their spare room. But many angel investors invest in one very small market niche that they know very well, they can they can make the introductions. They've been a success in that uh, in, in in that area. Um, that's really appealing, but of course they don't have the sums of money of a of a of a you know some some limited partners, some managing partners who are in a who are in a larger a larger fund. So a larger investor, of course, has got a wider range of uh, resources. They have to stress that, especially because uh, they might have. Uh, less lenient requirements from an angel investor. You know, an angel investor might know the market well enough to be really patient about you, to maintain your line of uh, uh, credit. I think a thing that I see startup founders really thinking about much more carefully now is, um, is, is, in, is interrogating uh, the investor in exactly the same way as the investor is interrogating interrogating isn't quite the right word, H holding accountable, gathering testimony, shall we say, yeah? Uh, you know, the, the, the startup founders are inviting testimony from, uh, from investors about um, what they are looking for, how they can contribute to execution, uh, the kinds of uh, relationships that they, that, they, uh, that they develop, how they work, when they have seats on the on the board, um, how other organisations value the insight of these um, of these investments. Certainly, we're seeing private equity firms, venture capital firms, developing much stronger marketing departments. I mean, there there are even um, uh, investment organisations that have analyst relations professionals uh, to help these startups um, uh, reach uh, reach out. And the and and the network effect with with other investments, you know, very often organisations are looking to invest in companies that might be synergistic with each other. You know, um, we do a lot of work on financial technology. One of the firms that we've been uh, working with is owned by a, a fund that owns I don't know, 20, 25. There's a final point that I want to uh, make, which is about culture. And I think yeah. investors appear collaborative when they show that they have a, a collaborative culture uh, that is easy for the startup to, uh, to absorb, to understand. And that means transparency. So I see a lot of organizations where, the, um, where that is even um, materialized. You go into the office, right by reception, they've got a little meeting room. The, the startups only ever go into that meeting room. That's the only place they see beautiful mahogany uh, table, dark wood, leather armchairs on either side of a, of, a, of, a, of a painting at the end of the room. It feels very powerful, yeah? Uh, but you don't really see what the operation is like. But then other organizations, they will kind of let you through into the back of the office. You see what's going on. Um, that, I think, is something that many investment organizations really struggle with. And I have to say, particularly here in Europe and particularly in mainland Europe, that a lot of investors have got quite formal, legalistic, authoritative, uh, power distance things going on that makes it really hard for, in, for, for, for startups to know that we've got the same culture. Uh, that we've got the same aspirations, that we've got the same uh, values, that we've got the same goals in the in the market, and 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 that's especially troubling because there's such an asymmetry of expectations about that transparency. 
investors expect the organizations they invest in to be totally transparent to them. Yeah. You know, so they, you know, they point somebody on. Yeah. To be right. yeah, I think, I mean, I think there's a case for, I, I would, um, I mean, that's definitely recently I've been uh, reading a lot more about, you know, the world of angel investment. And I think those involved in perhaps the later rounds of fund uh, raising, you know, either private equity, VC, I would, the way I would offer them to learn more from angel investors and the approach that a lot of the, the really strong ones take. Um, if you read like the book by Jason Kalkanis, I was going to talk about it later on, but mm. um, it's called Angel. And I just think that we could all learn from that approach because at, when you're investing sort of smaller amounts at the beginning, you do um, those initial investments. They tend to, they tend to, there tends to be where it works best is where there's a strong also personal relationship and a two way relationship where, um, you know, the investor is really a, really a partner. And, and if those investors involved in the later round are able to learn from that, I think it's just beneficial for all. Mm, absolutely. Um, I see we're almost at the halfway point. So, so let's, so let's move on to my, so to, to the, to the, halfway uh, question that we that we have here I, I think I've got a, a slightly shorter answer for it, for it for it than you will have later on when I ask the same question to you right sure so basically Duncan I mean I'm just interested to hear you've got such a background that cuts across both the world of entrepreneurship business um, obviously an expert deep expert in analyst relations but you're also a PhD you're also a lecturer at a very well-known university and it'd be great to hear what you advise us when it comes to content sources, books you're using, where you're learning, where you're drawing all this information so you can really compare with your underground experiences. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that, that, I've, uh, that I've seen from both sides of the table, you know, as somebody who start up, as somebody who's, who myself has started up a business, uh, you know, um, more than once I've been involved in scaling businesses, uh, obtaining finance for businesses, going through M&A uh, processes uh, with, with businesses. And I must say, for me, all, all the way through, uh, John Mullins's book on the new business road test has been a really important book for me. I'm, I'm so delighted to see it's now in its fifth edition. Um, but one of the things that that does is it, it turns the, it turns the spotlight away from just the offer and it forces organizations to look at their team so in in my in, in my work at the university um i've been i think f five uh, five times over now uh part of the teaching a team for a program on new venture development where we have master students coming in working together for a semester and developing courses and one of the things that they often use are um uh, are tools that help to plan out the, the scope of the solution that they've got. That, that's really super important. But um, actually, the way that you think your business is going to deliver is almost certainly not going to be the way that it that it delivers. Yeah. And having a strong team and having a strong division of labour inside the team is, is going to be really, really development is, is going to be really developmental. And understand having that flexibility is really key. Second thing that I would pick up from the people who who, who did the business model canvas, um, uh, David Bland and Alexander Osterweiler, Valder, is, is um, their new book on testing business ideas. So this is a really lovely structured methodology. Again, very tool-like, really accelerates the way that people uh, look at things. But it, the reality of the market is that we have to rapidly experiment much more than we used to. And their tool, their, 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 their tool really helps organizations to do this in a structured way that reduces anxiety and forces people to understand how to test their ideas before they overinvest in them. So that would be my, that would be my recommendation. Thank you, Duncan, that's great. So let's flip it around. <laughs> And uh, let's um, let's go through some questions that I uh, that I have for you, uh, Sarah. And I think in the first one we covered, right? I think I've talked about 
not an alias. But I don't want to. I think so. I think so. <laughs> yes. Um, but but yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a core um, responsibility of any founder. So um, yeah, I think we covered that one we were discussing earlier. Yeah, I think everything that we said earlier on absolutely applies here. And you know, when invest when investment is running out, the pressure is even harder on business exactly. leaders. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, the next question I kind of believe is, is, is obvious. I mean, for me, it's, it's so exciting to have somebody uh, like yourself who has, has worked uh, so, so broadly, I mean, in, in Africa, in, in, in mainland Europe, here in the United Kingdom, uh, in, in the United States, and, and now like, really digging deeply into, into the environment there in, in California. I think this must give you really different global perspectives. You know, I, I'm sitting here in, in the UK, my, 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 my clients are international, but I'm still you know, terribly British in my worldview, and you absolutely have got a totally global perspective. So how, how do you see this as being different? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, 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 the core things that, you know, are talked about and there's so much research out there, um, you know, when you look at differences between, say, the worlds of US, uh, Europe, and then Asia and, and other parts of the world, is, you know, the tendency of which part of the world tends to be more VC focused, and, and why is that? There's all sorts of economic reasons why, uh, and cultural reasons why that lend it, that, uh, itself to that. If you look at the cases of, you know, US, the US and, and Israel that have got such strong PC cultures, um, mm -hmm. there's plenty of, there's plenty of, um, reasons that you can find uh, behind that from a cultural perspective mm. and the tendency we talked a bit about it earlier with if you think of like mainland europe um uk to some extent although it tends to be in, in between the the uk and uh, the europe and the us um but really that that culture they're more of bootstrapping more government involvement more um a different sort of fundraising i was talking about working if you look at the case of some germany that has more um deep-rooted relationships in a supply chain which often can form, fi fi form financing then it's really important for the uh for your, you as a ceo to understand where you're located and it doesn't mean you're going to necessarily change your location because you know most of the time you'll go where the talent is and where you're based and, and where you're mm. going to be going to be happiest and where your clients are but um but really it's something to to think about in terms of um think about okay, how can you go beyond your local ecosystem in terms of uh, financing and also searching for, for talent? One thing that's interesting is that is the, I was looking at some research actually on, it was on Crunchbase, there's a report on there. If you're interested, it, it just send me, on link, send me a note on LinkedIn, I can I'll send it across to you. And it's, it's really, you know, talks about, there's lots of rankings that they give on, you know, who is, uh, which, which city is number one in terms of competitiveness for startups and so on and so forth. You know, now, of course, no surprises, you've got, you know, your Silicon Valley's leading, um, and then usually the next, the next sort of tiers are whether it's either New York, uh, London, Beijing, um, it really depends on the, on the, uh, on the research. These are sort of taking everything into account. But I think what's really interesting with entrepreneurial ecosystems is to look at the sector you're working in and think about where, where is that powerful? Because actually, you know, for example, uh, you take life sciences, well, actually San Diego is, um, San Diego, you know, whilst it might be, you know, it comes in, I think it comes in in this particular report, it came in about number 20 in the overall rankings, but then, you know, number, number three, um, sorry, then it's top tier when it comes to, uh, you know, life sciences. So oh. that's just really interesting to you know, think of like, um, there's a lot of companies you can, you know, think of come from that, that, uh, that background. And so just to, to really think about your, your sector as well, there's a lovely book, which I really recommend reading. It doesn't really cut, it's by Brad Feld and it's called Startup Communities. I also recommend following Brad Feld's work. He's, um, feels like I know him personally, although I do, he doesn't even know who I am, but I read a lot of his content and um, he covers what very well the startup communities globally. Um, not so much giving you um, the who's who on each city, but really thinking about, he gives a very nice case study of the Boulder community in the US. I'm really talking about why it was successful. He 
um, had a big influence on, was one of the key leaders in making that success. And, and really at that startup level, um, some of the key ingredients he talks about are things like, that we don't always measure, that we don't always talk about, things about um, you know, how collaborative are other entrepreneurs with each other? Is that necessary for your business? Mm -hmm. um, Boulder, there's very much, a, you know, he talks about the environment there. There's very much a sort of give before you get type of culture that he, he really tried to encourage and something yes. that he always tries to encourage when he's working with ecosystems, which, which makes sense is that um, a lot of um, when you when you think of entrepreneurial ecosystems you kind of imagine them being led by governments or investors or people who are either funding it or supporting the infrastructure <clears throat> actually what he says is excuse me one moment the best ones work when they're entrepreneur driven and when the entrepreneurs are taking a, a lead because ultimately they know what uh, their businesses need and rather than, and for universities and investors and government to really understand that whilst they have a big impactful role, they are a participatory, participatory part of that whole um, entrepreneurial ecosystem as well. So um, to think about that and to think about, you know, obvious things, obviously such as language plays a massive role. Mm. Uh, it's no coincidence that, you know, London investors, investors who, who are, um, you know, have got quite strong relationships with um, tech communities in Africa, for example, and Kenya, um, other places as well. Kenya has very much been at the forefront of Africa's technology development. I was there um, a few years ago, just after all the sort of M-Pesa launch, which was, um, which was an innovation for the, for the world um, in terms of um, you know, mobile um, payments as well. And to think about where are those, um, where are countries' global relationships lie um, India's startup communities have been made, obviously have strong relationships with the UK and US. We've been making very strong global ties with, with Israel too. So what, what, does that, what does that mean for your business? Um, mm -hmm. and, and just to sort of remember, ultimately, um, we get so, I think in our global news, we get so focused on, on micro news and what is happening. By my micro, I mean what is something that's, that's changing uh, the business culture currently but those foundations are still there so if you take for example when we were um last year when i was with um doing a talk with the future crowd in san francisco it was on the fintech environment and we focus a bit on the uk of course this was pre-brexit so uh, we got a lot of questions about that and the impact mm. but the reality is that um there were still huge investments going on into the UK. I know it, there are plenty of evidence to show being a decrease, but the fundamentals of the relationships that uh, some of these countries have and how that impacts on the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurial ecosystems, um, you can't take that away, the impact of language, the impact of you know, shared history and so on and so forth. So I think that's something that's very interesting you know, to, to think about there. I'm sure you've got Thing, you know, some anything to add yourself, Duncan, with your experience on that side of things from a university perspective or from a from a uh, analyst perspective. Well, I I, th I think you've really touched on 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 two key things. I mean, one is you know that that the flow of language is also linked to the flow of culture. Yeah. And at the at the University of Edinburgh, I'm involved in this project called the Analyst Observatory that looks at the impact of uh, of analyst investments. One of the things that we've seen there relates to Israel, where you know, which we were talking about earlier on, that of course the, the VC scene in in Israel is so huge and so entwined with the VC scene in North America, right. and it means that it's not just uh, you know much easier for Israeli firms than continental European firms to get onto the radar of, of analyst firms in, in in North America. But I think it's so much easier for them to get on the radar of, of all organizations in, in North America uh, because it's similar investments, mm -hmm. similar, similar relationships. Uh, I think especially in cybersecurity, you see that Israel has a fantastic brand, fantastic reputation uh, for, for leading. I mean, a, a whole series of technology uh, areas, telecommunications infrastructure, voice recognition. I mean, there, there are so many areas where Israeli companies are, are, known, are known to be leading. So these networks of, of, of language and culture and relationships, they accelerate the pathways of everything that flows along through it. 
The other thing completely accurately that I have to agree with is, is this thing about bootstrapping versus taking a ex external funding. Um, when, when, I, uh, when I studied for my MBA, I spent a semester in, uh, at Dartmouth College in, in New Hampshire. A lot of the students there are on entrepreneurial paths and they have no hesitation about trying to take as much money from other people as possible. And they really disdain small profitable business ideas they're totally disinterested in that they only want businesses that can be that can be massive right. and i think that is so different from what we see in europe where people want to bootstrap they want to use friends family uh you know uh, bank lending they're extremely cautious about diluting their equity they don't really care about how big the business has to be they just want a business that's got defensible profits and, and in a way, it, it, it's it's such a distinct set of of, of priorities that you could almost build a portfolio, uh, you know, out of these two different investment communities and these two different groups of uh, of firms. But it means that there's there's not competition for the same capital sources very often, and that many organisations are just voluntarily disqualifying themselves from the opportunity to access an investor pool that could be hugely um, powerful for them as a, as a tool for business growth. Thank you, Duncan. My next question is about ecosystems. And I, th I think we've touched so much on, on, on this in different ways uh, before, uh, but actually so many organizations try to go directly and don't necessarily take this ecosystem view. So what can you, what can you tell us about that? What have you seen about how vital it is for startups to really understand the ecosystem that they are in and then other ecosystems in other places? Sure. I mean, I think I definitely um, covered quite a bit of this, uh, you know, in my last question, really about understanding the differences between even some of the more subtle differences between the U U US and, and Europe, but also to think about um, appetite to to risk and to think about you from a we've talked about fundraising but talking about um, your talent and who you're going to be attracting to business because ultimately that's what's going to you know that's what's going to grow your organization um, and one thing that came, comes up that I think is quite powerful is the fact that you know you can think of if you take a uh, take market if you look at the comparison of GDP versus then uh, you know comparison of competitive competitiveness when it comes to startups they are quite often very different um, you know we've talked about the US but if you look at say for example um, Japan which um, you know very educated talent base um, from the startup point of view it doesn't always feature as highly as perhaps um, it could do from a point of view of, com of competitiveness that and it's not that there's not the talent but there is that culture around uh, risk-taking which I think is has to be um, factored in if you look at US and Israel um, very much more open uh, to to risk on that side from a cultural perspective and of course we're generalizing here I've seen plenty of uh, interesting startups come out from uh, you know the likes of Tokyo and, and, and other places mm. but it's something to it is something to take into account um, and you can like anything that you can also play to your advantage as well so to think about, um, I think the really um, the, the talent perspective there and really people's attitudes to work and why is it that, you know, there are startup communities where it's much more socially acceptable to be part of a startup and it's much more socially acceptable to be, um, you know, a, a more of a, especially at the beginning, a lot of startups will, they build their talent pool from um, freelancers and from people who are working for multiple organizations. So, and is there that culture there that that's embraced as well? Um, and you're going to get, you're going to attract the right uh, talent. I mean, London's great for that. London, you have um, not just, you know, from a point of view, there is that, there is a very strong community that you can feel part of. I know for myself being there, um, there's, there's a, it's, it's very alluring and attractive um, yes. for a lot of people to move from the corporate world into that. And not just only attractive, a lot of people have been forced by economic circumstances to do that as well. And so to become innovative, I think we've seen that a lot in London, a lot of uh, re people have reshaped their careers in a, in a big way. 
Um, and so um, some so to acknowledge that and to be aware of those those trends as well. I think it's important. Thank you. And so um, I think that that example actually of, of London uh, and the way that um, the startup scene has grown also means this incredible infrastructure that has grown up and much higher expectations, I think, from startups right. about the support that they get from uh, from 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 investors and, and people who are who are kind of articulating and organizing investors so what are some of the things other than funding that you're seeing investors and accelerators offering to startups yeah well I think um, I think if you look at uh, the more extreme side of it if you look at say California or especially San Francisco um, it's expected that there's a lot of advisors and people on boards who will work from a mentorship point of view for free. They will be put out of the goodness. They're able to do it. They have the big pockets to do it. They're passionate about it. Something that I talk, mentioned uh, in the startup communities book uh, is, is discussed a lot. Um, and it's wonderful to be able to do that and to mentor and to give back. Um, but also there's some environments, economic environments that allow you to do that. Um, and it's seen as it's expected as well by startups. It's very much expected in, say, San Francisco. Other places is different. It becomes more of a uh, is it a service you're paid for. Is it is it an accelerator you're joining? There's been a big trend. Obviously, there's been a massive trend for uh, accelerators and incubators. And some of them, there, there's some great ones out there. There's others which probably are you know just a little more than shared working space essentially. Mm -hmm. Um, not even that, 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 that's what they are. They're, they're another version, version of, a, of a WeWork, which is fine, but just be clear. You just have to be clear about what it is you're getting into. Um, one thing I was asked to do recently were by a fund in, the, in um, not here in the US, it was in, it was in the UK, was, I was asked to come up with some ideas and a strategy for how they, they, they could actually grow an accelerator, mm. uh, incubator and accelerator. Um, and so, um, you know, we had a good think about that. And what we found was um, really to the key, the key for that strategy, key for any strategy um, for accelerators investors is to think about how aligned they are with the startups and how they're communicating that to the startups. So, for example, you know, if they are funded by, you know, uh, quite often you have corporates who want to produce a venture fund or they want to have a... Um, investment they want to invest some of their profits into startups how aligned are the businesses um really with their core their core values and their background so are there other things aside from funding that they're able to offer the startups um and is it in their interest to do that so do they have um you know is there sort of cross fertilization that can happen with other startups or do they have engineers to access do they have technology to access have they come across the same challenges if they are for example, and they don't have to be in the same sector. They might have investments in, uh, they might have investments in companies that are perhaps, say, a company that invests in the world of, let's say, gaming. They might have applications for fintech uh, companies, or they might have. It's a lot of cross fertilization that can happen. So, if you as a startup are considering working with an accelerator, to really look at that and think about is it is it beneficial for you. Um, who is leading it? Is the person leading the accelerator incubator? Are they, have they, is their profile um, something that you would benefit from? Are they going to be able to introduce you to the right people? They're going to be able to open doors from a client perspective. And I think not enough focus is placed on, on those introductions. Everybody, there's so many, um, everyone can find, you know, it's very easy to access coaching and advice on sales and marketing. But are you able to get those actual key raw introductions um, because mm -hmm. that, that's really that's really what you want to to be looking for is to have to be able to leverage the network of your investors and any accelerator teams that you're you're involved in as well. And if it is an accelerator program you're going into, to really look at how well designed it is. Do they have what are the team members they have supporting the accelerator as well? Um, to understand, you know, do they have they got a is there a, has it, they've got a core of a sort of specialist program designer on it um, to think about it, look at it from, uh, from that point of view. Um, I don't know if you've got any comments to make 
and I even Duncan, we you and I've discussed this quite a bit um, in the past as well. Anything you would like to add? That's true. No, I th I think you've. Um, I mean, I think it's sad, but it's absolutely so true uh, that uh, that so many accelerators are, are bringing their so many investors are trying to look more attractive by calling themselves accelerators. Right. Yeah? Uh, but actually, uh, you know, they've they've just got a mate that's got some spare office space, and they're trying to do something with it. You know, um, I mean, I I can I can um, I'm I'm not going to name names, but I mean, I, I can really think of some examples uh, in London where 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 these were clearly just people whose families had made real estate investments, and they right. and they and they were trying to leverage real estate investments that they that they had. I think I can think of two in particular. Uh, in East London, uh, that 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 definitely had that uh, that definitely had that character that seemed to me to have that characteristic, and um, expectations are much much higher now. Um, there are so many places where you can get cheap office space, and in organisations that are mature enough and desirable enough to be able to afford office space that isn't minimal and cheap. Yeah, uh, you know, I think startups these days, you know, they're better at accessing capital. The cost of capital is lower than it used to be, you know, mm -hmm. five, 10, 15, 15 years ago. So actually, it's a little bit easier to run a well to, 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 to have a decent level of funding for a startup. And, and, and the lure of, oh, my God, we've got an office somewhere in Shoreditch. That's amazing. Well, you know, that, you know, that, 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 that's not a, a differentiator in, 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 many, in many places. There's one, there's one last thing that I should uh, that, that I should say, which is that I'm seeing investors and, and accelerators getting much more aggressive about business models, about offers. Uh, I mean, the classic example of this is Rocket, you know, Rocket Internet in Berlin, yeah. where it's almost like they've got a cookbook, you know. And if your recipe isn't working, they will just show you a different page in the cookbook, and they'll and they'll and they'll point you in a different direction. Maybe even disassemble, reassemble teams. Uh, you know, and get them to work in different in different directions, and that can be brutal. But of course, it's more likely to ensure that the people involved in those projects are going to get through to whatever kind of business is going to allow them to generate the most value, and um, and that requires a, a really mature, supportive adult relationship that absolutely has to be underpinned by similarity of culture. And it's really worth taking the time to make sure that you, you have that similarity of culture, as you say, not just with, with that investor, but with the other organizations that that investor is valuing, because these, uh, it's like marrying into a family, you know, you know, you, you have to meet the relatives, the people who you're marrying to get a, a good idea of what the journey is going to be like. Yeah? But, and it, and it, I think that initiative that you talk about is, is a very smart approach and for entrepreneurs to to embrace themselves as uh an entrepreneur not just for not just for the business that they're working on but you know if if that doesn't work which is is highly likely because that's just the success rate just shows what how what are they going to transform into from that you know so it's not it's not about uh you know whatever they've learned from that can then be applied to another venture and any strong accelerator or investor can appreciate that um but there has to be that two-way relationship where they um they're able to support them on that journey and it's not mm. just seen as a, a failure it's seen as a step to uh their next level as well i quite agree okay. so let me move on to you on to our final and most fun question uh which is oh. about favorite books content sources what, what are the resources that you think are, are most valuable for people who are grappling with the questions that we've been talking about in the in the webinar today? Yeah, I mean, there's just so much there's so much content out there that I tend to right now go for very targeted, focused content that's going to give me an answer to what I'm looking at. So, in the, if we think about what we've been talking about, um, I think one of the one of the books I'm really enjoying um, at the moment is called um, Venture Deals, and it's by um, Jason Mendelson and Brad Feld, I mentioned Brad Feld earlier, mm. but why I like it is that of all books I read, it really goes into the details around the deal and the negotiation process you go through if you're fundraising with lawyers, with um, you know investors, and so it goes through case by case, it gives you even you know term sheets, everything, 
So I highly recommend that, like mm. a you know that type of approach. Um, everything's everything's in there. It's really it's really quite uh, detailed. So I like books around that. Um, also, the uh, Lean Startup is one of the book I'm enjoying at the moment by Eric Ries. It's very um, mm. it's very much like a sort of book to how to scale batch mm. process. Very much anybody who's um, what I think it does well is it links the the process of technology development and innovation to um, commercialization and to testing it with different client groups as well. So um, that's one that I'm, I'm enjoying very much in the moment. Um, and there's just, there's so much out there. We're interested to hear from people listening to this. Um, I would just like to say as well, um, you know, uh, Duncan, thank you, thank you very much for, for hosting us and coming up with this, uh, this idea. I think we My should pleasure. Do. Um, it'd be great to get some entrepreneurs on to, uh, you know, talk again and uh, investors as well. Um, but it's been really, really stimulating to discuss this with you. And, um, I, you know, I look forward to um, doing it again as well. My pleasure. My pleasure. Well, our, our hour is is almost completely up. I'm, I, I'm so sorry to, to listeners who are here. Normally we have the time to have uh, have questions and comments, uh, you know, a bit, a bit of chat submitted in the webinar. But I think on on this occasion, I think we'll have to wrap things up uh, straight straight away. The one last thing I wanted to ask Sarah: Can you just remind us of, of how people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more about about you and, and your work? Sure, it's um, Investors with Impact, which is Sarah at Investors with Impact dot com. Uh, Sarah Nichols, and also on LinkedIn, you'll find me. Find me there, um, connected with Duncan Chapel, of course. Thank you. It's just good to, uh, good to discuss with you and uh, look forward to doing it again soon. My pleasure. Have a wonderful time in California. Thank Speak you. Speak to you soon. Thank you. Speak Take care. Bye-bye.